Good afternoon and welcome to the Central Asia Metals PLC preliminary results investor presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors are being in listen only mode. Questions are encouraged. You can be submitted anytime via the Q&A tab situated on the right hand corner of your screen. To click Q&A, scroll to the bottom, type your question and press end. The company may not be in a position to answer every question received during the meeting itself. However, the company review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. Before we begin, we'd like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand you over to Louise Rathel, Director of Corporate Relations, Gavin Farrar, CFO, and Nigel Robinson, CEO. Good afternoon. Hello. Yeah, good afternoon. Okay, good afternoon and welcome to uh, Central Asia Metals PLC's results for the year ending 31st December 2021. A record year for Camel. Just uh, quickly through the disclaimer. Um, just a reminder where we operate in the world. We operate in two countries at the moment, Kazakhstan in the Central Asian region. That's where we started the business with a, uh, an in-situ dump leach SXEW processing facility, which we've developed over the years, now been in production almost 10 years. In fact, 10 year anniversary is the 30th of April this year. Uh, and we've got a life of operations out to 2034. And our production for 2021 was just over 14,000 tonnes of pure cathode copper. On the back of the success at uh, Kunrad in Kazakhstan, we then invested in an underground lead and zinc mine in late November uh, 2017 in North Macedonia and Balkans area. Uh, and that is, as I say, an underground lead and zinc mine, which produces around about this year's guidance, 20 to 22,000 tonnes of zinc and 27 to 29,000 tonnes of lead, and has a life of mine out to 2037. Just some highlights of our 2021 results. Um, as I say, a record year for Camel, generated revenue of $235 million with an EBITDA, that's earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization of 141.5 million. An EBITDA ratio of 60% and a record EBITDA for the, for the group. That was primarily on the back of very strong commodity prices that we witnessed. So copper traded over $9,000 per tonne, which is what we received over the course of the year, and zinc over $3,000 per tonne. Both of those up almost 40 to 50% on previous year prices that we received. So that translated into the very strong performance you see here. And that also feeds down into our free cash flow line of just south of 104 million dollars for the year and that number is important because that's the number on which we base our payback to shareholders so our dividend policy is to pay between 30 percent and 50 percent of that number back to shareholders and on the basis of that the board agreed a 45 percent payout ratio uh, resulting in a full year dividend for 2021 of 20 pence that consists of eight pence paid last year on the interim uh, results and a final dividend now of 12 pence. So that's 20 pence, uh, which on yesterday's share price is a dividend yield of close to 8%. On the balance sheet, we've strengthened the balance sheet over the course of the year, paying down debt. $48 million of debt was paid down, leaving us with a balance of $33 million. That's $9 million of overdraft and about $24 million of the corporate facility. Offset against that, we had $59 million in cash in the bank leaving us with a net cash position at the year end of $22.7 million. Other highlights of the year, we had a credible production performance, over guidance at Kunrad by 14,000 tonnes, as I just mentioned, slightly under guidance both uh, for zinc and lead at Sasa, which was slightly disappointing, but we encountered some difficult ground conditions there, and that is a justification for our transition to the cut and fill mining method, which we'll talk more about later on. And finally, but by no means least, a couple of other uh, issues to address on the highlights. One is we're reporting today a 17% reduction in our group greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, that is because we signed a 100% renewable energy contract with our electricity supplier in North Macedonia. On a full year basis, that will be 35%. Uh, and, and slightly disappointing, I guess, is the four LTIs in 2021 that we experienced. And more about that in a minute. What's the purpose of Camel? Why do we exist? We are a mining company, but our purpose is to produce base metals, which are essential for modern living, profitably and in a safe and sustainable environment for all of our stakeholders, not just the shareholders, but all the stakeholders. And we're in three key metals uh, that are very, um, very significant for the development of the world over the next few years. Copper, as everybody knows, as we move further towards decarbonisation, 
and renewable energy. Zinc is a popular product for galvanizing products. And then lead as well, which is a useful battery product um, for stationary storage batteries, etc. Just moving on from there, Louise, if you don't mind. You may have stuck. I'm not <laughs> sure whether you have. So that, that's our purpose. And that purpose informs us all the way across the patch into our values that we uphold as managers and as employees in the group. Uh, our immediate strategic objectives, which are to focus on sustainability and more of that in a minute, to target low cost and high margin operations, and to ensure that the money that we make from those operations is, is used prudently in our capital allocation. And again, more of that later. Uh, and our long term objective is to grow the business. Um, and it also informs how we measure our success. We have KPIs set against the management team and lots of the uh, managers within the workforce and how we manage risk within the workforce as well. Just for me, yeah, is it a bit slow? Mm, sorry. sorry. <laughs> on again. So those are, that's our purpose, and those are our immediate strategic objectives. Just enhancing on one of them, which is a focus on sustainability. We have five pillars to that, and we've determined this over the past few years in conversations with our stakeholders uh, and having an external company auditors effectively to see what was important to our stakeholders. And those five pillars consist of delivering value through stewardship, maintaining health and safety on site and across the workforce, focusing on our people and their development, caring for the environment and unlocking value for the community. So those are the five key pillars. And that addresses about six of the UN related sustainable development goals. On health and safety, I've already mentioned the four LTIs. If you look at the chart on the right hand side, you'll see we had a poor year in 2018. And over the past three years, we have improved that. We've had five LTIs now over the past three years. Five is still too many. And we will work on learning the lessons from those LTIs on site and trying to improve our performance, both at Kunrad and Sasa. Although I have to say at Kunrad, we have an exceptional performance there of zero LTIs. And we've now gone over 1300 days since the last LTI at Kunrad. We have no issues at the moment on site with COVID-19 and over the past two years, I think the management team at both sites has managed um, the COVID-19 situation to maintain production and the delivery of our products into the, uh, the, to, into the marketplace. Caring for the environment, something uh, close to our hearts. Uh, I'm very pleased this morning to announce some, some objective targets on environmental um, goals that we have. The first one is on climate change. On the right hand side, you'll see I've already mentioned we had a 17% reduction and the confidence we've got in what plans we've got in place has enabled us this morning to announce that we will target a 50% reduction from the 2020 base by 2030. So we've got another eight years to achieve that 50% reduction and a number of things will help us do that. One is the renewable energy in North Macedonia, the contract that we've signed and continuing that. The board has approved a solar farm at Kunrad uh, that will contribute around about 7% at group level of a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. And the other aspects you can see there on the right of the chart are things that we're working towards now and we feel confident enough that we will deliver on the full 50% by 2030. Likewise, water, an important um, resource for all mining companies, and we've announced a 75% reduction in the abstraction of surface water by 2026. And likewise, a 70% um, improvement in the way we manage our tailings, so that's managed in an environmentally responsible manner, uh, or more, should I say, in terms of dry stack tailings and backfill pace uh, by 2026 onwards. Both of those targets are associated with the work we're doing on cut and fill, and also the uh, initiatives we put in place to recycle more water through the process plant. And last but by no means least on the environment, many of you may well know that we had an incident in September 2020 at the tailings facility at Sasa. And we've worked hard to maintain our goodwill in the community and also clean up the river from any pollution that we left there. And we've now completed that work uh, after that incident. And I think the community, community are uh, happy with what the way the river now looks. Um, and so we're, we're pleased with that particular initiative. Just moving over again, communities, a uh, good track record on that. We have two foundations, one at each area of operation, both at Sasa and at Kunrad. Uh, we spent around about half a million dollars last year there is money in the banks. These are separate legal entities that do charitable work and development work with the community. And money is set aside every year from the revenue generated the operations to help the community. And that's just a showing where we spend the money. 
And last but by no means least on the sustainability um, strategic objective, uh, looking after our people um, in terms of training them, diversity targets. We are we have been having uh, committees formed at both operations to see where we can improve the workplace to make it more attractive uh, to diversify the workforce. And we'll be working on that in the coming years to attract more females into the mining operation where they are eligible to operate in certain roles. Training and development, we need to do a bit more on that. We've got a good track record on health and safety training, but I think we can do more on the softer management skills and also the equipment skills across the patch. And we're putting a focus on that to have a dedicated training team to improve training and standards, especially as we move to the new methods of mining at SASA, Cut and Fill, we make, need to make sure that we train the workforce properly. And we have about 99% of our employees that are from the actual country of operation. So very low reliance on any kind of expat workers and it's primarily a local workforce, something that we're very proud of and something that we'll continue to, to work on and focus on. And last but by no means least, governance, working with suppliers to make sure that all the suppliers we deal with work to a certain standard and have a certain code of conduct that, that we're comfortable with and that we can be comfortable having a supply relationship with us. And we've developed a, an online governance and stewardship program in 2021, which we'll be rolling out in 2022. Uh, and on that, I'll hand over to Gavin to talk through some of the financial numbers in a little bit more detail. Thanks, Nigel. We start with the market conditions for 2021. It was, uh, compared to 2020, a much more positive macro environment with the corner being turned on the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of uh, stimulus packages and vaccine rollout programs there. Metal prices responded positively, not only to the growing demand as a result of that um, economic recovery, but also a transition to the green economy. And we also, as a business, saw tailwinds from treatment charges where we saw 15% decrease in treatment charges year on year. This is the cost of transforming our product, which is a fine powder called concentrate into metal itself at the Sasa mine. And then currencies um, were uh, a little bit of a mixed, uh, a mixed bag there. We, we sort of gained on the Tengi and lost on the, uh, on the North Macedonian um, Denar. But if you look at the charts on the right hand side of that graph, you can see the overall trends in commodity prices through the year um, increasing with the average prices, as Nigel said, you know, up to 50% greater than what we received in the prior, prior period. That translates into a very strong income statement uh, with record revenue, um, record profits, and record EBITDA um, all the way down the income statement um, with uh, large double digit increases uh, period on period there with the um, earnings per share going almost double um, year on year in that case there. Um, on the other side of the equation, uh, cost of sales has gone up a little bit. There is some inflationary pressure um, embedded within there, but we also include those adverse FX movements, plus also royalties, uh, which we pay to the um, governments of that, uh, in our host countries, and those are directly related to those increased commodity prices themselves. Um, if you look at the left-hand side in the notes, um, both Conrad and Sasa have performed very well as well, uh, with 50% increase in revenue at Conrad, basis that copper price increase, and uh, Sasa also um, recording a, a large uh, increase in both revenue and EBITDA through the year, in spite of those headwinds we spoke about earlier. Through the development of the EBITDA from 2020 to 2021, um, it's very clearly driven by those uh, improved commodity prices, so with copper revenue in particular out, uh, you know, um, outstanding, and lead and zinc contributing as well, plus that $3.4 million um, benefit from those improved <coughs> charges. Uh, the little brown box to show where we've uh, sort of, um, experienced some pressures. Uh, the royalties, as I said, went up, cost of sales, GNA, and then the hedging losses, we put, put some hedges in place at the beginning of uh, 2021. Um, and the commodity prices you know, far outperformed our expectations, um, you know, landing us with that $141.5 million EBITDA results at the end of the year. So this, this is always a, a good slide to present. Uh, the Kunrad operation is always at the lower end of the cash cost curve for the industry and remains there, even though costs have gone up um, by six cents a pound year on year. Uh, a lot of that cost increase is down to salaries and, and electricity price increases, which is just general inflation, really. And then we did have a little bit of a blip in our reagent consumption in Q1, which has now been sorted out by the metallurgists, so we don't expect any um, any more fallout from that, but driving a fantastic EBITDA margin of 80% uh, 
at that operation. Sasa, um, again, increases in costs, but uh, inflation there is just driving a three cent um, contribution to that 13 cent increase. Um, we did produce uh, a few units. Uh, we had some production problems, which um, have been sort of well publicized. Uh, that drove a five cent increase in the unit cost. Um, offset by those lower treatment charges of three cents, but eight cents of that 13 cents cost is simply down to the way that we calculate this cost, which is basically um, converting lead into zinc, and the relative prices of lead and zinc therefore contribute to that um, sort of big difference in cost there. If you look at the, um, it's the third last line of the table, we can see the unit cost on a run of mine basis going from $39.2 per ton to $44.1 a ton. That's more reflective of the performance of the business. And as I said earlier, a quarter of that increase is down to adverse currency movements. CapEx uh, for the year, we came in just shy of our guidance, um, $14.7 million spent against guidance of 15 to 17. This is a little higher than um, what we usually present to the market. Uh, primarily because of the cut and fill project, which we're undertaking at SASA. Um, the chart on the right-hand side breaks down the capex into sustaining for both SASA and Conrad, with the middle bar of that chart showing you the cut and fill um, project at $5.9 million. We did make some prepayments um, at, all th at, at both um, operations, plus for the cut and fill project, in order to try and mitigate against price increases that we anticipate coming through um, uh, owing to inflation. And then if we want to break down the capex, um, the cut and fill project is effectively three elements to that. It's the central decline, which is a new access portal to the mine. Uh, there we spent money on new equipment, plus also capital development. The paste backfill plant, which is a, a fundamental part of the uh, cut and fill project, that's going to basically form the paste that we pump back down into the voids underground. Again, a um, bunch of equipment plus some pipe work um, to actually transport that, uh, that paste. And then lastly, the dry stack tailings, which is another surface tailings treatment, uh, sorry, surface tailings storage facility, um, which has so far cost us one and a half million dollars. And the sustaining capex, the usual um, items in there that you'd expect for an underground mine, underground development, that is, is, is effectively boring new tunnels to access ore and some new equipment. And then at Kunrad, um, replacement of the anodes in the, um, in the electronic house, plus also some extra pipe work to irrigate the dumps. Balance sheet looking really strong. I think Nigel hit the, the key points there. Uh, we now net cash. Um, debt we've paid down. We actually paid an extra $10 million of debt um, throughout the year uh, to get our corporate debt facility down to $23.4 million um, at year end. We expect that to be fully repaid in August this year. And we still have some Macedonian uh, overdraft facilities which remain drawn. And uh, cash balance at the end of the year, $59.2 million. So as I said, really good shape on the balance sheet there. Last but not least, the cash flow. Um, cash generated from operations, $136.6 million, a, a, a pretty stunning result there. And if we take off the tax and interest from that number, we get to the net um, cash flow from operations. And if we deduct the sustaining capex from that number, you'll end up with that $103.8 million in the box. Uh, which is the basis of the dividend calculation for our policy. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Gavin. Just a quick counter through the operations. Uh, Coonrad, many of you will have seen this slide before and over your photograph of the open pit at the Coonrad mine, mine since the uh, 1930s, and we process the waste that's on surface, so the dumps, the eastern dumps there and the western dumps. We estimate that there's about 126,000 tonnes of recoverable copper left in the operation. We have a life of mine just to reiterate out to 2034. Quick slide on the production profile. As you can see, we started production almost 10 years ago, as I said, 2012. We grew it to the point in 2016 where it was up around the current levels, and we've been operating at that level for the past six years, quite um, quite religiously almost, really, and it's optimised at that level in terms of managing the solutions around the various dumps into the SXEW plant itself. Slightly different metallurgy on the eastern dumps and the western dumps. We're now primarily operating in the western dumps. Last year was 15% production from the east and 85% reduction from the west. In future years, that percentage will increase to the west until we're fully uh, operating out of the western dumps. And there's a traditional leach curve you can see for one of the western cells at the bottom there. Leach time can be anything up to 20 months on a western dump cell. 
to get 35 to 42% of the copper recovered. On the scale of it, really, I mean, it's huge areas that we're operating with, with huge uh, kilometers of installed drippers. So we've now installed over 7,000 kilometers of drippers on the dumps. We operate uh, the area under leaching, should I say, at any one point in 2021 was around about 64 hectares, uh, 37 in the west and 27 still uh, in the eastern dumps. And you can see the grades, very low grades, really, not significantly high grades at all. We did have a blip in 2021, thanks to turning on the uh, solution or the leaching, should I say, uh, dump 21. I think it surprised us a little bit how high the grades were, and that's led to that slight increase in 2021 to 0 0.121 but still not not huge grades but large volumes of solution low grades producing the amount of copper that we need in a pure form and you can see there was the production for last year 40 14 ,041 tons so that's kunrad moving on to sasa uh, now owned it for four and a half years we acquired it in late november 2017 for just over 400 million dollars since that time we've almost paid off all the debt and as gavin said we'll pay that off in august uh, that we took on at the time of the acquisition and it's generated for us 245 million dollars of EBITDA to the end of 2021. It's got a life of mine out to 2037. Um, and again another slide just showing some of the statistics for the uh, past four years of the ore mine. We've made marginal improvements from when we acquired it taking it over the 800,000 mark uh, but we've kind of hit the point where by we feel uh, with these ground conditions we've encountered, we now need to stabilise at that before we move into cut and fill effectively over the next two and a half years and we transition into that. Our guidance for this year, uh, in terms of ore mined, will be, be between 790 to 810 and the zinc in concentrate 20,000 to 22,000 tonnes and lead 27 to 29,000 tonnes. So strategic objective number three was ensuring prudent capital allocation, which is really four aspects to it in many ways. And the cut and fill project is a key one of those. So when we acquired SAS, we took some time out to understand the operation a little bit better uh, and decide what we were going to do with it. If it needed improvements and we at board level agreed this move to cut and fill mining, which I think has been justified by some of the ground conditions we've experienced both last year and have continued to experience this year. Gavin's already mentioned there are three components to it. I think the component we probably best understood when we went into this was the pace back fill and reticulation. Um, we're well advanced on that particular part of the, the project. Likewise, the central decline, um, it, we're well advanced on that. We've done 650 metres of development, both from the surface and from 990 level. So we started drilling uh, underground initially, and we've uh, started um, in August, I think, of last year to start drilling from the surface. And those two tunnels hopefully we'll meet at some stage um, <laughs> uh, and that's the central decline 3.8 kilometers in total over the next three years and that'll provide you know far more efficient access into the ore body will allow, it'll allow us to use bigger machinery in the future we're doing a cost benefit analysis of potentially going to electric machinery which would use that 4.5 by 4.5 meter tunnel so it gives us a lot more levers to pull in that sense and it'll improve the ventilation at lower levels in the mine so it's a key part of the project as is the pace backfill. And the one element we didn't know as much about maybe a year ago that we do now is the dry stack tailings and how you manage that. Maybe the filtration plant we were fairly well versed in, but certainly the land form and the civil engineering and the management of water, and indeed where we were gonna place those dry stack tailings wasn't exactly known a year ago. We've now identified the location. You can see it on the, on the map there. It's the old TSF1 and TSF2 that have been decommissioned. Um, so we know where we're going to place it. We have a space for up to about 4 million tonnes of tailings there. The authorities have insisted that we do line that with the geosynthetic clay liner, but at least we now have agreement with them as to exactly what they require, and we can design to that manner. And that's, that's sadly occurred about a three-month delay on it, but we have got clear direction and actually a good working relationship now with the ministry and the working groups at, uh, at the Ministry of Environment, which is all positive for the future as we introduce this technology and this way of managing tailings for the first time ever in North Macedonia. Just a couple of pictures showing you the pace backfill plant and the dry stack tailings. I think I've touched enough on that, but we are well advanced on this. And the plan now is to complete the construction of the pace backfill plant by the end of Q1 2023. We'll then go into a commissioning phase in Q2 2023 before starting the transition into cut and fill mining during the year in the second half of 2023. In parallel to that, the dry stack tailings uh, filtration plant 
and also the landform will be constructed so that's available uh, in the second half of 2023 and we'll then have three methods of managing tailings which will be either through backfill paste dry stack tailings or the current tsf4 which still has capacity uh, at, at its current operating level for another four years of tailings Dividends and debt repayments, I think myself and Gavin have probably banged that drum um, sufficiently hard during this presentation, but just to remind you, we have paid our oh, announced this morning a 12 pence final dividend, making 20 pence, which is 45% of free cash flow, and takes it to just under $257 million we've paid back since December 2012 when we announced the dividends policy 10 years ago. Uh, and we've almost paid off all the debt. In fact, that will be paid off by August of this year. And the fourth leg of capital allocation, which is probably the hardest to, to actually give any specific details, is, is delivering growth in the business. We recognise fully that we have two very good operations, generating very strong cash flows, paying good dividends to shareholders, but we do need some growth within our portfolio. Myself, Gavin and Louise, and other people in the company, we've taken on a group geologist, for example, are looking at the opportunities that are out there for us to use this strong platform from which to grow the business. Ideally, copper is our preferred metal, but we also like zinc and lead, and we'll look beyond those three metals for, for other metals which, as we say, are essential for modern living, so base metals or battery-type metals. Um, we have a strong balance sheet to grow from, and we're very cognizant that we need to get to that next, um, that, that next level, really, to improve our size uh, and liquidity, and they're important considerations, as is the increased political risk we see across the world at the moment. That's a factor we have to take into consideration. And also all the ESG considerations. We've committed this morning to a net zero by 2050. Well, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realise that at the current uh, portfolio of assets we have, we won't have any operations beyond 2037. But clearly, we wish to grow the business. And so we'll be looking at that net zero aspect when we look at opportunities to grow the business. And we'll be looking across the patch from early stage exploration through to production. Uh, as we um, free the balance sheet of any debt and therefore increase our capacity to take debt on. Uh, last but by no means least, you know, outlook, a summary of all that. We have a strong business, strong EBITDA and free cash flow. Uh, we're paying good dividends. We've strengthened the balance sheet. We won't have any debt by August. And the outlook for this year, we believe we're in a pretty strong metal price environment, certainly for this year um, in the shorter term. Um, longer term for copper, the, the fundamentals are very robust. Um, there is clearly, as everybody on this call and sure knows, there's a lot of political uncertainty and macroeconomic uncertainty that we're operating in, but you know, we can only control what we can control. We will pay down our debt by August 2020. Uh, we're looking at aspects of our climate change scenario to improve our sustainability reporting even further from the great work that Louise has already started in the group probably two or three years ago. And we'll put out our third sustainability report in April of this year. And on that note, I'll hand back to the, the operators for any questions that may, people may wish to ask. Fantastic, Nigel. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you all for the presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, do please continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated in the right-hand corner of your screen. But just while the team take a few moments to review those questions submitted today, I'd like to remind you the recording of the presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed via your investor dashboard. Louise, if I may just come to you, we've received a number of questions, both pre-submitted and throughout today's presentation. And thank you to all the investors that have submitted them. If I could just ask you to read out the question where appropriate to do so and just direct it to a member of the team, that'd be fantastic. Sure, will do. Okay. As uh, so the first question I have is, um, the company had declared its intention to expand at a time when other miners were finding it difficult to raise capital. How close is the board to agreeing the purchase of a further metal asset? And if no deal is agreed, might the rise in metal prices mean that Central Asia has missed the timing sweet spot? Who do you choose? Oh, who do I choose? <laughs> oh, I'll choose Gavin. Oh, okay. oh sorry, <laughs> Nigel. <laughs> oh, Paul, thanks for that question. I think, um, yeah, of course, we have declared the intention to grow by our acquisition. Um, there's always a question mark over timing, um, but... I think your point around sort of capital raisings and the like, <clears throat> what we find is actually quite difficult to engage in sensible conversations with people or with, with vendors when the prices are low because the valuation gap is just too wide. And it's actually, you know, ironically for the mining company, it's always easier to raise capital in periods of higher commodity prices. But um, that aside, what we're always looking for is accretive um, transactions. And we also use what uh, consensus long-term commodity price decks 
in, in evaluating these things. So, you know, a combination of the profitability and at those consensus decks will really drive the, the decision of a board whether or not to execute on the transaction rather than the timing of the cycle. What we try and do in that analysis is make sure that capital returns to shareholders are available through the cycle. So therefore we are looking at assets that are probably lower cost than most would, uh, would take. Yeah. Okay, um, the next question we've got is, um, has the unrest witnessed in the country had any impact or is it expected to have any impact on operations? Also, does the dreadful Ukrainian situation have any direct impact on the company, given the relative proximity of the countries, i.e. any transport routes that pass through or close to Ukraine? I'll choose Nigel this time. <laughs> Um, good question. I think it's two parts to this question. The first one is the unrest in Kazakhstan, first of all, and then the impact on the operations. Well, clearly, most of the unrest was not close to where we operate. We operate in the centre of the country near Lake Balkash. I think it was pretty tense for a few days, I have to say, and the staff were a bit nervous about it all. And there were people on the streets and, you know, um, in line with what was going on in the country. The impact on the business is clearer to, for us as a management team to understand and manage really, because we have good contacts in Kazakhstan. Um, I think the government's been pretty clear on how they intend to address this through the president, Tokayev. Uh, and the, the impact ultimately will be an increase in our cost base, I have to say, from a very low cost, as we've just seen. But we expect some of the taxes to increase, the two key ones that will affect us. And it's not official guidance yet. This is our understanding from talking to people in the know in the country is that MET will increase from 5.7% to 7.4% which might affect us about, on an annual basis, around about $2 million a year in terms of additional NET. And the withholding tax, that's the tax you pay on money when you transfer it out of the country back to the holding company. That could increase from what's currently 0% for us because of grandfather rights and having operated there for some time up to 5%. Again, that could be an effect of, say, $1.5, $2 million. We're quantifying it now. It's not 100% clear exactly how it's going to work. But it's of that magnitude, and uh, I think it's something certainly the profitability of Kunrad can, can manage. Um, the, the only other aspect of it is the is the pay rise aspect, and we do pay good salaries for start off. We'd already authorised a ten percent increase at the beginning of the year before the, the unrest occurred. Clearly, we looked at that. We've had a benchmarking exercise done so, so we can make sure that we're still competitive with people like Kazakh Miss, Kaz Minerals, and Altin Olmas, which is another big operator fairly close to where we operate. So we're, we're dealing with that. I think staff are comfortable that we're dealing with that uh, and understand you know, our approach to it in terms of the local unrest in, in country. The Ukraine aspect, that's just added further complication, I think, to be fair, in Kazakhstan. And I, I do think the president is handling it fairly diplomatically, really, and trying to keep favour with all the various people that have invested into Kazakhstan over the years. That's both facing eastwards, westwards, and I guess you could say north up to Russia. So very difficult for him to manage. Direct impact on the business. We have uh, in the past shipped our copper cathode over land and it's gone for a very short period of time through through Russian territory. And so what we've done in line with our offtake partner, Traxis, is that we've agreed temporarily a new route which goes through the Caspian, therefore doesn't go through Russia. So that's the immediate impact that that has. I mean, there's a far broader uh, question there, I think, as to how it affects Kazakhstan. Uh, but, you know, they are an independent nation and they're, they're operating you know, independently in that sense. And we're managing to operate quite successfully still there. There's just that small knock on effect. I guess the, the last two things to say on the political angle is, one, our hearts and minds go out to everybody who's been affected by the Ukraine issue. With great sympathies. We have people in the head office here who work, who, who sorry, are Ukrainian and they've been severely affected by it, as you can imagine. So, so we all consider it for, for those people. And... And the other side is that any sanctions that are imposed, we, we will support those, whatever the UK government, US government or EU government impose on, on Russia. We've looked at our supply base in terms of where we procure uh, aspects from. We're not exposed to Russia in, in any great shape or form. There are some suppliers and we'll stop those supplies um, immediately and find alternative suppliers. So there's no major material impact on the business in that sense. Okay, um, the next question we've got from Richard is, what do you see relevant commodity prices being this year, Nigel? Um, I, I'll really go by what the experts tell me, to be honest with you. And if I look on, on the pack, we've got copper. I mean, copper, I think, is holding up well. It's a volatile world, and, you know, copper is such a great metal for the transition that everybody's trying to make to net zero. And so 
we've got from our analysts copper holding up well above eight thousand dollars per ton, closer to eight thousand five hundred dollars per ton. So I think I think you know copper's um, the copper price will remain fairly strong throughout most most of this year before some of those fundamentals get redressed and you find a bit more supply coming into the market because there are still supply disruptions. Chile's been badly affected. Uh, over the course of um, you know the course of the past twelve months or so, so I think those supply disruptions, together with a, a, a large increase in demand across the world, maybe not driven by China so much, but the rest of the world with the transition, the demand, I think something like four or five percent increase year on year. So that's feeding through to keeping copper prices high at the moment. Longer term or medium term, two to three years, I can see them coming slightly off that. But the long term fundamentals for copper are very good. Uh, likewise on zinc, I think it's a similar story, but it's driven by other factors in many ways. There's, there's issues to do with smelting capacity, and obviously they're very, very hungry for electricity and energy, and the price of energy, which is, as, as we all know, gone uh, increased significantly, has affected some of those operations, and some have temporarily closed down, which affects affects the, 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 the price of the refined metal that we receive, and also the availability of smelting capacity. We're very we're well covered on our smelting capacity. Gavin and his team have done a great job to get us covered in contractual terms all the way out to March of 2023. But I think the knock-on effect is that the zinc price will probably stay reasonably high for the next 12 months before, again, some of the fundamentals reassert themselves and more supply comes into the market and we see a, a reduction slightly in price. And the last one, I suppose, is lead. I'm, I'm, I'm probably less close to the lead market, but certainly the impact on the automotive industry. I mean, lead acid batteries are used, what, 80, 85% of the use of lead is in the automotive industry with those kind of batteries. And we are seeing impacts on the automotive industries with the, with the semiconductor chip issues, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, I think there's less secondary lead in the market, which is impacting the, the primary lead market and keeping the prices reasonably high at the moment. Okay. Um, our next question's from Peter, um, who's congratulated us on our results and the dividends. And then he asks, can you update us? us on your intentions to consider a move to the main market, considering such a move would be an enabler of your key priority of delivering growth? <laughs> Who oh. picking? Nigel. <laughs> we haven't talked about I'm this. We're in a position of power so here, aren't we? Thanks for the question, Peter. We haven't actually touched on it as a topic. Historically, we've talked about going to the main market several times and never actually pushed the button on it. I think really our plan is that to we intend to do the business development and find the next opportunity and once we go down that path of acquiring something that might be the time we consider it in, in more you know more earnest um, seriousness really we're, we're not considering it at the moment with Sasser and Kuma. Um, Okay, uh, next question from John is that the camel share price looks undervalued versus these financial results. Will management consider use of the increasing free cash flow from strong commodity prices towards pursuit of a share buyback program supplementary to dividend payments to take advantage? And that's one for Gavin. Thanks. Um, thanks for the question, John. I think look, it is a, a subject of sort of sporadic debate within our board as to whether you do share buybacks or not. And I, I appreciate it. I think as management also feel that we're slightly undervalued given these results. So um, thanks for picking that up. The, um, <laughs> we, we've actually, funny enough, had some analysis done by third parties on sort of peer valuations, various other things, and, and also the value generated by share buybacks for companies of our size. And we've always come to the same conclusion that it's not really worth doing. Um, so therefore, you know, the question then, would probably pose to the board later this year as to what to do with that additional cash. And I think we've covered a few of the options um, with it, uh, you know, today in terms of growth, but also we've also had feedback saying that the dividend policy, the 30 to 50% of that free cash flow gives us enough flexibility that the market's comfortable that, you know, we can allocate more to the market, to, to shareholders within that policy rather than going and changing the sort of capital allocation program right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we've got another question from John. Please confirm the 2021 period of having commodity price hedging in place is now closed out and hence for 2022 financial year onwards, Camel is now fully exposed to commodity spot prices. It's another one for Gavin. John, thanks for the question. Yes, um, the hedge program rolled off at the end of December. Now, uh, we're very pleased actually that we generated far more cash than expected or that we would be budgeted for through this year. So consequently, there's no intention to hedge for 2022. Um, the reason we put that hedge in place in the first place was effectively to protect the business against adverse commodity price movements because we had um, 
not only the debt to repay and the capex to fund, um, but also wanted to keep paying dividends. So I think, you know, given where commodity prices are gone, where our cash position is now, there's no reason to hedge. Okay. Um, our next question um, from John uh, is regarding Kunrad, a layman's question. He says, is the leaching a once-only process or with a suitable copper price plus a decade of additional weathering is a second pass possible uh, for Nigel? Oh, thanks, Liz. <laughs> so listen, from one layman to another, <laughs> uh, if you talk to our experts, our expert on this, we had a really good leaching team, and Howard's the expert who set this up. He would say quite categorically that beyond 2034, and there's no reason why we can't extend the license, we would be a preferred partner to do that, we can continue leaching at Coonrad. Not at the same levels as we are at the moment. And in fact, the second pass, as you call it, we already do really with like a what we call rinse and rest. So we'll leave a cell for quite some time, maybe up to two, three years and go back to it and squeeze some more copper out of it. But as you, as you saw on that leaching curve on one of the slides I showed, it does tail off. On the Western dumps, after 20 months, it tails off to say between 35 and 42%. On the Eastern dumps, where we've been leaching now for 10 years, it tails off at about 50% after about eight to nine months. Well, the reality is we're already doing that second pass to an extent. Some of those cells in those dumps have probably delivered 55% now. So it's, it's marginal, but it's at minimal cost. And that is something that we would look at in the future, but it would not be at the same kind of commercial level that we, you know, develop the leaching plans for for the for the western and eastern dumps as as the core license period. And um, we've got a question from Michael: Are there any further acquisitions on the horizon? I think we've maybe covered that one off already, uh, or at least yeah. as much as we are able to say. I don't know if there's anything you want to add, Gavin. Or I think we probably have covered that. Hopefully, Michael. Um, question from John. Uh, no mention in the presentation made of the Ukraine war situation and Turkey very high inflation situation. Are these seen by management as significant risk to Kunrad copper offtake transportation and sales going forwards, noting that the Traxxas offtake agreement was previously defined as expiring soon in Q4 2022? So is there a risk of non-renewal of offtake agreement and consequential difficulty to transport or sell Kunrad Copper going forward. Um, I think we've covered the first part of that question. Um, I don't know if Gavin can comment on the Traxxas um, offtake agreement. No, I, I think it's a it's a reasonable question. I think what yeah. you've got to remember, though, is that the copper that we produce is LME grade A copper. So it's effectively a fungible instrument. So if somebody in Turkey, for whatever reason, no one wants to buy it from Traxxas, Traxxas will find another buyer for this copper at any rate, and last resort, they put it into an enemy warehouse. So yeah. um, it is a, a valuable commodity, regardless of you know what the sales arrangements are. Um, Richard is asking what the future prospects are for finding or taking on new businesses as commodities are looking to have a positive next few years. I don't know whether we I think we may have covered that. I don't know if there's anything else we can add. Mm -hmm. Not really. I mean, it's, it's a valid comment. Yeah, I mean, yeah the commodity prices are very strong, and uh, you've got to be confident enough when you assess the assets we're looking at that you look at long term prices and strike a deal because um, you know that's that's the way you that's the way we manage SAS really in terms of long term prices. They do they are cyclical as we all know, even if we might be into a different cycle now with copper potentially. Yeah. Um, we've got a question from Steve who is saying, um, given the company name includes Central Asia, um, he wants to ask if investing outside of the area is seen as a way of getting a higher rating and spreading investment risk uh, for Nigel. Yeah, I mean, I think it's always wise to spread your risk. We, we had this on a previous call, actually, whereby in the early days we just had an asset, in, you know, cannot be a great asset, but it was just one asset in one country, which not everybody likes Kazakhstan necessarily. So you do have to diversify your kind of geographical political risk, and we'll look to do that um, as we, we look at other opportunities. But we do like and have successfully operated in Kazakhstan, so that doesn't put us off buying another asset in Kazakhstan. But overall, you know, we aren't just confined to the Central Asian region. I know the name still says that. We had a debate about this a few years ago, whereby we decided, because everybody knows as, as Camel and Central, you know, we, we're well known. We didn't think the timing was right to change that name because we may then get a little bit lost in terms of who we were and what we were doing there. So it is something we're conscious of, um, but there's no plans to change that at the moment. 
Um, Mazin is asking, is there a common reason why no M&A opportunities closed over the last year and how the current M&A opportunity is looking like? Um, I think we've probably answered the second part, uh, but maybe Gavin can comment on the first part of that question. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Lizzie. And as Louis said, I mean, we, we're constantly signing NDAs and looking at things, so there's always a pipeline of, of opportunities we are considering. As to your question as to, uh, I think commonly these things do fall over on either price and value or as I'll euphemistically call it artistic differences between management teams. So, you know, we, we have had lots of conversations in the past and haven't found common ground on either strategic um, objectives or values is the general thing. Um, is that going to change? Yes, I think we are seeing some buyers that are, sorry, some vendors that are uh, not, that are, have a, a reason to sell. I mean, you've seen a lot of assets um, being funded by private equity companies over the last five, six years or so. Those funds are coming to the end of their lives, so there may be some opportunities coming out of there. And we've seen a few of those transactions occurring, in fact, in the last couple of years. Um, and then also, I think, as Nigel mentioned on his slide, scale is becoming increasingly important and to get uh, uh, the attention of a broader fund, um, fund manager base. It may be wise to sort of join up with somebody of a similar size. So there's always those sort of discussions that could be had at some point as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think the last question I've got here is from Quentin, which is, does the expertise that Camel has gained as a result of its work at Sasser and Kunrad give it any advantage when assessing possible investment in other operations? Um, who wants that? Gavin. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's a good question, Quentin. I think the short answer is yes, it does, because we have, as Nigel mentioned, a lot of leaching expertise. So if we were looking at any leaching assets, we think we've got an advantage there mm -hmm. because we can do diligence things quicker and also uncover any sort of fatal flaws, should there be any. And then with SASA, yes, we got in some new expertise, particularly in terms of underground mining and um, yeah, managing tailings and various other things. But we've also importantly bolstered the technical team over the last three years or so. So we've got yeah. metallurgical managers, we've got geotechnical engineers, we've got um, you know, resource geologists, all joining the ranks here that help us in the assessment of any opportunity. Mm. That's fantastic, Louise. Thank you so much for running through the questions. And Nigel, Gavin, thank you. You've answered every single one we've had through. Um, if there are any further questions that do come through from investors, uh, the company will have the opportunity to review those and will publish responses where it's appropriate to do so on the Investor Meet company platform. Nigel, before we redirect investors to provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to you and the company, could I just ask you for a few closing comments, please? Yeah, I, I think it's on our slide there about the outlook, really. I mean, the closing comments, these are fantastic results. We're delighted to announce them, a record year for us. On the back of strong commodity prices, um, record dividend being paid back, strong balance sheet. And I think the future you know, for our company look, looks bright um, in terms of the training of people, our sustainability push, I think is holding us in good stead. The last question was, was an important question in many ways because we, we asked that ourselves. I said, you know, what gives an advantage in the marketplace? And I think the advantage really comes from how you deal with the people in your business, the sustainability aspects of the business uh, and the, the profitability and the track record we've created over the years to get to this point 10 years after first producing copper at Kunrad, um, we've built a very strong business and, and good platform to, to grow from there. Uh, I think that's the key message really alongside all the, the, the high level financial numbers and, and operational numbers. That's fantastic. Louise, Gavin, Nigel, thank you again for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close the session as you now automatically be redirected to provide your feedback in order the team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete and I know it's greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Central Asia Metals PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's session. That concludes today's meeting. Thank you. Good afternoon.